Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, so excited to see you today. We're starting a new series today called Liberated, and uh, it's going to be on the book of Galatians. We're going to be looking at some really important things in this incredible book. But uh, as we get started today, I want to say hello to all of our uh, online uh, family. We have an incredible online family, people that are watching in many, many states, uh, not only locally, but translocally as well, and people around the world. And we're just so grateful for our online listeners today. So grateful that you're tuning in. And also, our amazing Fenwick Island campus. Would you give the Fenwick Island campus a big hand? And greeting to you guys. We love you guys so much. And uh, so we're grateful that you're here. I also wanted to mention, this is kind of special to me, uh, my son Tim is here today with uh, my, two of my grandkids, uh, Willa Grace and all that. Now you get to see Joel all the time, but this is my son Tim. Tim, would you stand up? I know Tim just kind of hanging out here, didn't want to be incognito, but this is my son Tim. So He's building a big house now, and he's going to make a room for his mother and I. That's what we're believing for. So anyhow, it's good to see have Tim with us today. So in this series, we're going to be talking about uh, the book of Galatians. And the big theme in the book of Galatians is this idea of liberation and freedom. Uh, and this is so important. When, you know, whenever Paul wrote a book, uh, it always was addressing a problem. So if you want to understand anything that the Apostle Paul wrote, you always have to answer the question, what problem was he dealing with? So in this, uh, this is probably the very first book that Paul wrote in the New Testament, but more importantly, probably this was the very first book ever written in the whole New Testament. This preceded Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Uh, this is probably the very first book Paul ever wrote. And he's addressing the most important question in Christianity. And that question is, what is the basis for us to have salvation? What is the basis for us to have salvation? And so the deal was that Paul had uh, come to this area called Galatia. That's in like central Turkey, southern Turkey. And uh, in Acts 13, 14, uh, that's when he's traveling, planting these churches. And he's telling these people about Jesus the good news of Jesus, and they are, these are Gentile people. They aren't Jewish people for the most part. They're mainly Gentile people that weren't raised under the laws of the Old Testament. And so they hear the good news about Jesus that although they're Gentiles, they can now be included in the faith and they can have relationship with Jesus. And so they readily accept Paul's message and they were so excited, and they hear uh, the gospel preached. And he says in the book of Galatians, before your very eyes, Jesus was, was portrayed as crucified. So Paul lifts up Jesus on the cross as the way that we would be saved and have eternal life. So that is the, how the book, what the book is about. And then after Paul gets done preaching, he kind of leaves the area to go somewhere else. And what happens is, is these people from Jerusalem come, and they come, and they say, well, listen, it's great, it's wonderful that you accepted Jesus, but that's not enough. You have to do more than that. It's not simply enough to accept Jesus in your heart. You must also keep the Levitical laws. You've got to be, if you're a man, if you're going to be in the real family of God, you've got to be circumcised. And a lot of those Gentiles hadn't been circumcised, and the men started waiting in the car before church. You know, they weren't sure they wanted to go in and be a part of this. So the, the message that these false teachers presented to the people that were a part of Paul's uh, evangelistic success, these were people that accepted Jesus, loved Jesus, believed in Jesus, but then people came along and said, that's not enough. You've got to do other things in order to have salvation. You've got to, if you're a male, you've got to be circumcised. Uh, you've got to keep the dietary laws of the Old Testament. You've got to, you can't eat certain things, and you have to keep these festivals that the Jewish people had. And if you do all of that, plus Jesus, then you will have salvation. So this is, this, and if you read the book of Galatians, when you read the book of Galatians, what you'll discover is that Paul is frustrated in this book. The Apostle Paul is frustrated. He's, you know, we get to see the edginess of Paul in this book. In fact, he says in the book, he says, I wish these false teachers would just go ahead and emasculate themselves. He is frustrated. Every book that Paul starts, 
you know, almost every book, every epistle that he wrote, he always started with saying nice things about people. He always said, you're doing good with this, and you've got these wonderful overseers, and I'm just so blessed with these things that you're doing. And he always began his books with sort of encouragement, then doctrine, and then practical application. But in this book, Paul doesn't do any of the warm fuzzies. He gets right to the point. He's frustrated with them. And he said, I can't believe, you foolish Galatians, that you've been bewitched by this false doctrine. So that is what the book is about, and Paul is just coming right at them. He is frustrated. It reminds me of, uh, and I don't think he's, he's frustrated because of a personal offense that people have come behind him. I think he's frustrated because he's concerned for them. He's concerned that they bought into something that's not going to give them salvation. And so he's struggling with them about that, and, and so these people have come behind Paul. It reminds me that... You know, sometimes Karen mops the floor, you know, at our house. She's a, such a great cleaner and keeps her house all clean, and she mops the floors. Have you ever had been in your house when someone, when your wife mopped the floor and then you wa- wiped, walked on the floor? Have you ever had that problem where you got in trouble because you walked on the floor after she mopped the floor? And, uh, boy, that causes some real trouble in our household. We have to call for marriage counseling when that happens. I mean, that's a big problem. <laughs> And so I think what's happened is Paul has presented the gospel and these people have come behind him and they have tried to undo what he was trying to do and help the Galatians in understanding the salvation that that Christ has given them. So let's read a little bit of Galatians chapter 5 verse 1 through 6 so you can understand what this book is about. Galatians 5 verses 1 through 6. Just Uh, uh, just as it is for freedom that Christ has set us free, stand firm and then do not let yourselves be burdened again by the yoke of slavery. So Paul is saying, make sure that you don't, you know, find freedom in Christ and then put yourself back in bondage. And this is the problem here. They they found freedom in Christ. The gospel has been preached clearly and they're putting themselves back in, in bondage. It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then and do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. And then he says, mark my words, I, Paul, tell you that if you let yourselves be circumcised, Christ will be of no value to you at all. Again, I declare to every man who lets himself be circumcised that he is obligated to obey the whole law. You who are trying to be justified by the law have been alienated from Christ. You have fallen away from grace, for through the Spirit we eagerly wait by the faith, the righteousness for which we hope. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision has any value. The only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. And then he says in the first chapter, I'm astonished that you are so quickly deserting the one who called you to live, uh, to live in the grace of God, Christ and are turning to a different gospel which is really no gospel at all. Evidently, some people are throwing you into confusion or trying to pervert the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach a gospel other than the one we preach to you, let them be under God's curse. And we have already said, so now I say again, if any man is preaching to you a gospel other than what you accepted, let them be under God's curse. So Paul is saying, we want you to live in the grace of God. We want you to live in this reality that Jesus has died for your sins and that that is sufficient. What Jesus did on the cross is sufficient. There's nothing deficient in what Jesus did on the cross. You don't have to add anything to that. When uh, Jesus died on the cross, the last thing he said on the cross was, it is finished, meaning that there is nothing left to do after you accept Christ as your Lord and as your Savior. And so what happens to us is we have this tendency to hear the message about God's love and God's grace and God's mercy. We accept that, and we're forgiven for all our past sins. And then we think, but from now on, we got to live a right. We got to live the right way. We got to do all the right stuff. We got to keep all the rules so we can stay in right relationship with God. So Paul is saying, if you do that, you have thrown away the grace of God. 
You were saved only by grace, only by what Jesus did on the cross for you. So I, I was raised in a church that sort of was, you know, a good church, but it was a little legalistic. And we were always told we should fast and we should pray more and we should share our faith more and we should always have our devotions. And all of those things are wonderful things. But in my mind, it was connected to my acceptance before God. So I thought that, you know, God loved me, but he loved me more on some days than he did other days. Like on the days that I had my devotions, on the days that I, you know, maybe I fasted and prayed that day, or I shared my faith with somebody, on those days, God really, really loved me. And I had a, tr had a lot of difficulty being raised in church, not really understanding that I was saved by grace alone and nothing else. It wasn't until I was in Bible college and I was taking a course in the book of Romans, about 100 people in the course, and I'm sitting there, and here, here I'm a little kid, or a grown man then, but I had been a little kid raised in church, listening to preaching, listening to songs, being in church every Sunday, every Sunday night, Wednesday night, youth group, and I never understood that I was saved by the grace of God. And I was sort of like always working for God's favor, always trying to get God to smile at me. And I had the problem that the people in Galatia had. The problem was that they were told, it's great you accepted Jesus, but you got to do these things. you got to add to Jesus these other things. And if you don't add to Jesus these other things, then you are not going to be a part of God's family, and God is not pleased with you. So I remember one time somebody gave... Uh, Karen and I, a Ruth's Chris uh, gift card for Christmas. Uh, anybody ever eat at Ruth's Chris? You ever eat at Ruth's Chris? It's a great restaurant, great uh, steaks. I had never eaten there before, but the folks in our church gave us a uh, $100 gift card. A hundred dollar gift card. So I was really pumped up about this because for number one, I had never been to Ruth's Chris and I loved steak. So I was really, really pumped up about that. The other thing I was pumped up about was it was free. Somebody had given us a gift card. So I'm really excited. And so we go to, down Route 50 on our way to Ocean City to where the Ruth's Chris uh, restaurant is. And we go in there and, you know, we ordered our steaks and all that. But every little side dish cost money too. So what I discovered is $100 wasn't nearly enough. $100 sort of like took care of the hors d'oeuvres. I mean to tell you, I'm still making payments on that meal. I mean to tell you, it was expensive. So my $100 gift card was not enough for me to pay for that meal. And so we got the side dishes, we got the drinks, we got the, uh, the dessert. And so I had to shell out almost as much as a gift card to get out of that place. And when you think about your salvation, your salvation is not like that Ruth's Chris gift card. It's not like God played for part of your redemption. He paid for all of your redemption. And if you add anything to the cross, you have perverted the gospel. Paul said in chapter 1 of Galatians that these people that had come to the Galatians and said to them, you've got to do this, you've got to do that, you've got to do these other things, and if you don't do these other things, then you're not going to be saved and you don't have a real authentic relationship with God. He said that is a perversion of the gospel. So me growing up in church, I had this sort of a vision of it's me and God that provides my salvation. And it was what he did plus these other things that I did that equaled salvation. And I had perverted the gospel. And I was not enjoying the gospel. And I was not enjoying the Lord because I always felt like I needed to do a little bit more. And if you've been raised in church, maybe you've been raised in a traditional church and you've heard preaching and you've heard, you know, all these challenges, you know, that we need to do this, we need to do that and all that. And there's a place for being challenged and all that. But at the end of the day, your salvation, and my salvation is exclusively provided for us by Jesus. We have a duty-free religion. A duty-free religion. There's no duties that we must do in order to be saved. And if we try to add to 
what Jesus has already done, then we have perverted the gospel. Someone said that you spell religion D-O. Religion is you got to do something. You got to do more. I remember Karen and I uh, were in New York City one time to see a show, and we went to, uh, had to, went to see the show at the Gershom Theater. And so I took Karen out to dinner before the show, and I took her to one of those hot dog stands on the street there. And I said, honey, we're up here in New York, you know, splurge, get the jumbo dog if you want to, whatever you want. But the guy running the hot dog stand was a Muslim. And it just so happened that the time we were buying our hot dogs was the time that he was supposed to pray. So in the middle of the transaction, he pulled out his little rug and on the center of the street there in uh, New York City, he prayed toward Mecca. And he prayed, you know, he's a Muslim and so he needs to pray five times a day. He's got to pray five times a day. He's got to, you know, fast during Ramadan. He's got to, if he can, make a pilgrimage, pilgrimage to Mecca. There's things he has to do to please Allah. And so in the middle of our transaction of the buying the hot dog, it was time to pray. And so he began to pray. And we can admire that and all of that. And, and you certainly got to admire somebody's conviction. But every religion in this world, other than Christianity, pure Christianity, is a religion of do. Do something. You've got to do something. Islam particularly is designed, uh, as a, it's a, a, a religion of works. I must do things to please Allah. And if I do enough good things, then I will be in right relationship with Allah. And one day I'll live in paradise. Now, it's possible that there are Christians that have that same mentality that that Muslim man had. Because uh, religion is spelled D-O, Christianity is spelled D-O-N-E. It is done. Jesus has done everything that needs to be done. Now, the objection that we begin to hear in, in ourselves is this objection. Well, what does that mean? Does that mean we can just do whatever we want to? Paul addresses that in the book of Galatians. He talks about the fruit of the Spirit. He talks about being transformed in the Spirit. So we, we present uh, fruits of the Spirit that are like Jesus. But all of our good stuff that we do, including coming to church, you're not coming to church today, and some people sometimes... Come to church thinking, okay, if I get in so many times a month and God's watching me, he's kind of keep, keep in attendance, and if I come to church enough, that is added to what Jesus did on the cross, and then I will be in right relationship with God. Now, let me just tell you something. I certainly want you to come to church every week. I love when you're here. But you don't come to church to get any favor with God. You come to church because you are so excited about being in right relationship with the Lord that he's redeemed you and you love him so much you want to come to worship him as Corey and the band were leading us this morning, these wonderful songs. You come to church not out of obligation. You come to church out of love. I took my wife out on our Friday date on Friday and I didn't do it out of obligation. I didn't do Oh, it's Friday. It's Friday, got to take Karen out again on another date. <laughs> oh boy, I wonder how much this is going to cost me. I bet she's going to order the most expensive thing on the menu. Just kind of go through obligation. I didn't go through, it wasn't obligation. It was, it was love. I wanted to be with her. We went out to eat and went to Nectar, then took a little nap. <laughs> You ever take a nap on your date? If you're in our age bracket, that's a wonderful thing to do. <laughs> you go to the beach, put the old chairs back and take a nap. You know, we go parking every Friday, I'm telling you. <laughs> then we went to a movie, we held hands, and came home and spent the whole day together. But it was, it was out of love, not of obligation. And if you add anything to the gospel... Anything to Jesus' cross, 
in your mind, you have perverted the gospel. You were saved because of what Jesus did. And you believe, here's the key to salvation. Salvation is not about doing anything. It's about believing in someone. It's not about doing anything. It's about believing in what he did on the cross for us. It says this in Romans 10, 8 and 9. Confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that God has raised Jesus from the dead and you will be saved. Confess with your mouth. Jesus is Lord. Lord, I believe you're Lord. I believe that you died on the cross for me. I believe that. And I believe that you've been raised from the dead. If I confess and believe in my heart, I'm saved. That's the only thing that I'm required to do. It says in John chapter 6 that, that the, uh, the work that God has given us to do is to believe on the one that he has sent. So if you're like me, and you were raised in a Sussex County church, like I was raised in a Sussex County church, that you got to live it, you got to do better, you got to try harder, you got to fast more, you got to pray more, you got to witness more. If you're raised like that, and you, that's in your head, and that's what you believe, you have perverted the gospel, and you are not enjoying the gospel. You are like the Galatians. You think that Jesus is great, but I've got to do these other things. Now, here's the thing. Here's the thing about the law. You know, there's 620 laws in the Old Testament. Not just the Ten Commandments, but there's 620 laws. So the deal is, is that none of us can keep even the ten. So if we just narrowed it down, forget the other 600 and, you know, uh, 610 laws, and we just focused on the 10. We can't even keep the 10. You know, 10s, that's not a lot, but we can't keep the 10. You know, it says you should not commit adultery, you should not murder, you should not steal. Paul thought he was pretty good. In the book of Romans, which is his masterpiece, Romans, Paul said, I thought I was doing pretty good keeping the law until I read that one that says, thou shall not covet. Have you ever rode by and saw somebody's house and thought, man, I'd like to have that house? You ever rode by somebody's, you know, their property and thought, boy, I'd love to have that? You ever seen somebody's position and you've, even in your heart, if you desire and covet what another person has, you have already broken the law. And here's the deal. The book of James says, if you break one law, if you break one law out of the 620, If you break one law out of the Ten Commandments, you're guilty of breaking all the laws. It's all-inclusive. So you can try really hard and mess up and break one law, and you're guilty of breaking all the law. It says, and then Paul develops this in the book of Galatians. He says, it's impossible for a person to be justified by the law because we can't keep the law. And you say, well, you know, I'm pretty good, though. I've never murdered anybody, and I've never committed adultery. Well, Jesus kind of ups the ante on that in the Sermon on the Mount. Sermon on the Mount, he says, if you've ever gotten mad at your brother and hated your brother in your heart, you've committed murder in your heart. Well, jeez. How many have ever gotten mad at somebody, really mad, like you want to just give them a whack? Just raise your hand right now. Anybody ever there? And, you know, Jesus said, you've you've committed the the sin of murder according to Sermon on the Mount then you say well I've I've never committed adultery never never committed adultery never one time committed adultery well Jesus said if you've ever lusted a woman in your heart or had a fantasy you committed adultery in your heart now why did Jesus up the ante in the Sermon on the Mount why did he do that he did that to show us that we are all guilty of breaking the law. He wasn't saying try harder. He was saying be honest with yourself. You may not have physically committed adultery, but in your mind you have had fantasies that aren't appropriate. So we're guilty of breaking the law. And if we left here today and we said, we're all going to go out here and we're going to try harder, try harder, try harder. We're going to try not to get mad at anybody. We're going to try not to get upset with anybody. And it just happens. 
to us because we are flawed. The law reveals that we're flawed and that we need a Savior. That's the reason the law was given. And if you break one law, you're guilty of breaking it all. Karen and I were a couple Sunday nights ago, I think two Sunday nights ago, we went to the Avalon Theater down in, uh, in Easton. They had uh, Garrison Keillor there, Minnesota storyteller. And uh, I like Garrison Keillor. I've always listened to his, all his stories. So Karen and I went to a show. He was going to be in Easton. I thought, wow, that's pretty close. So we bought the tickets and we went over to the Avalon Theater. And uh, we had a wonderful time. I took her to a nice restaurant. That was a nice restaurant, not the hot dog stand. I took her to a nice restaurant. And uh, then we went to the Keeler show, and he talked for like two and a half hours. Just, you know, it was really wonderful. It was a really old group there. Garrison is like 79. And so it was like, we were like the youngest people there. The smell of Bengay was in the air. I'm telling you, it was like <laughs> a lot of old people there. So we felt like young folk, you know. But on the way back, we're just we're having a good time. We're holding hands in my truck and having a wonderful time. And, and uh, we're coming on the way to Preston. We're out there in the boonies, you know, that, you know, you go to Bethlehem and Preston. It's just in the boonies out there. And then we're just having a good time talking about the show and holding hands. And, and then I saw the cop lights behind me, the disco lights. I thought, geez, this is going to ruin this night. I'm telling you. I thought, I thought for sure what I'd done is I, you know, those little towns, they changed speed limits, and I thought, I, I, they got me for speeding. And the lady came up there, I had my hands on the, on the, on the steering wheel, and I'm like wanting to be good. And so uh, she said, you know why I stopped you? I, I said, no, I, I, I did wanted to say I was probably speeding. But she said, no, she said, you know, you're, you got your license plate in the back, and, and there's one of those lights, those little lights that shine up on the, on the tag. Uh, one of those lights is out, and you've got to be able to read your license plates from 50 feet away. And I can't read your license plates from 50 feet away. She said, did you know they were out? Did you know that one of them were out? I said, yeah, I knew they were out. And, and here's what she stopped me for. She stopped me for this. Can you see that? That's what she stopped me for. And she didn't give me a ticket. She gave me a warning. And, uh, and I went and replaced these yesterday. So if you uh, need me to replace these for you, I'm really good at it. So, <laughs> so I broke the law for one of these. And I was guilty. She could have given me a ticket. And if you break the law in any respect, you're guilty of breaking the entire law. And when Jesus, it says, if we break the law, we're under a curse. That's what the Old Testament teaches. If you break the law, you're under a curse. And then it says in the book of Galatians that Jesus was put on a tree and cursed as anyone that's placed upon a tree. So Jesus is on the cross and the curse and judgment of God came upon him in your place. This is the big mix, mess, up, mix up, mess up in American culture right now. We don't understand the gospel. The gospel is not Jesus loves you, he's all for you, he's going to let you in the kingdom because he loves you so much. That is not the gospel. If you hear that on TV, if you hear that in any church, you hear that in any Christian book, that is not the gospel. That's a perversion of the gospel. God is not going to let you into heaven because he loves you. God is going to let you into heaven because Jesus took your curse on the cross. His, the judgment of God, the wrath of God, if I can say that word, and it's in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, when Jesus comes, we'll be delivered uh, from the wrath of God that's going to fall on people that don't know Jesus. And if we don't understand the wrath and justice of God, we can never understand the good news of the gospel. We have incredibly good news because Jesus has taken the justice and the wrath of God for us on the cross. And he came under the curse for us because we broke the law. So the gospel is not accept Jesus and try harder. The gospel is Accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Believe in him and enjoy the gospel and know that you don't have to do anything else to add to that to find favor with God. But you live a life of celebration of his redemption for you. So 
It's so easy for us to go through our whole Christian life and live under the law. I did it for 23 years, living under the law, accepting Jesus, but thinking I had to do more. And if I didn't do enough, I wasn't in right relationship with the Lord. If I missed my devotions one day, oh my, boy, God's not happy with me today because I missed my devotions. If I didn't do this, he's not happy with me today. And all I was, as I was like the Galatians, I accepted Jesus, but this word in my mind came and said, well, that's great, you accepted Jesus, but you've got to do this, this, and this, and this in order to be in right relationship with God. We are called by God to live in a spirit of celebration after Jesus has redeemed us. And that's why we're here this morning, to celebrate that he's completely forgiven us and Jesus is all that's needed for us to be saved completely. It's only Jesus. If I get... If I stand before the Lord one day, there's, I'm, not, I'm not pulling out of my wallet, my spiritual wallet, anything to show him. I'm not saying, hey, I went to church, I went to seminary, I shared my faith, I helped people when they were in need. I, I'm not going to do any of that. I do that, those things, because he has changed me and I'm so full of love and grace because of his wonderful grace that I do that out of a spirit of celebration. The other day, uh, Karen and I were having dinner at the house, and uh, I think it was Wednesday night, Willow was with us, and we were just eating dinner, and, and Karen's phone was on the bar, and it kept, her phone kept ringing, and, and uh, we just kept eating, you know, and enjoying our dinner, but it kept ringing, so we, Karen thought, well, there's something going on, so she went and she got her phone, and the phone uh, was, uh, was FaceTime from her little grandson, Nixon, and, and so we FaceTimed Nixon back, and Nixon was so excited because he'd lost his first tooth. And he was just telling everybody that this great thing had happened. And here's a picture of Nixon. You can see him there. And he lost his first tooth. And, and, uh, and he's just so excited. And I never saw a little boy so happy about losing a tooth. Because this great thing, his sister had lost all her teeth. She just pulls them out with, you know, pliers, you know. She just wants to get the money, you know. But Nixon was happy because this great thing had happened. And so our Christian life is just living in celebration for what Jesus has done for us. And during this series, I want you to read the book of Galatians. I want you to read it every week. Just read it over and over again. And I want you to see that when Paul said, you know, if you allow yourselves to be circumcised, if you allow yourselves to start keeping the Jewish dietary laws, if you allow yourself to be sucked back into keeping the law, then Christ is of no value to you at all. And you have thrown aside the grace of God. We're called to live in grace, not just visit grace at salvation and then go back to works. We're called to live in grace. And if you are holding on, maybe you've been in church 20 years, 30 years, 40 years. If you're holding on to grace with one hand and works with the other hand, you have perverted the gospel and you are not enjoying the gospel. I heard Mark Rutland preach recently and he was talking about when he was a kid, he was watching a parade and there was this uh, guy in the parade standing up on two horses and he was uh, standing up riding these two horses and, uh, and this little boy on the side of the parade waved a red flag and one of the horses went one way and the other horse went the other way and the guy got hurt in the parade. And as I was looking or listening to that, I was thinking about how we live our Christian life one foot on grace and the other foot on law. And we live in that, that, uh, that ambiguous position because we're afraid that the grace of God is not enough. Jesus, what he did on the cross, is more than enough. He's forgiven you of every dark thing you've ever done, every dark thing you may have done this week, and he's forgiven you of every dark thing you may do in the future because you have put your faith in him, and he's redeemed you inside. 
and you have a, a new desire to live for him. That's why next week we're going to talk about, you know, how can grace, how can we accept grace and have this freedom to walk in holiness? And because the big fear is you got to keep people down. You got to tell them they got to do this. If you don't do it, Lord knows what they're going to do. The irony of that is, is it doesn't work. You go to church, the more they beat you down, the more you'll sin. Because you have been redeemed by the love and grace of God. And, and every morning you wake up, the sun is shining because Jesus has forgiven you of all your sins. And you live that life in celebration of the Lord. And if you're grateful for the amazing grace of God this morning, would you say a big amen? amen. So I want you to say this with me. I am, I am. holding on just to grace for my salvation. Some of you have heard me tell this story many times, and uh, forgive me if you've heard this like a hundred times, but uh, there was this, there was this uh, airplane one time that had four people on it. It had a, a pilot, and it had, a, it had a, a computer genius, this technical genius of computer uh, development, and then there was a Boy Scout, and there was an aged minister. And there was a problem with the airplane, and there was only three parachutes. So the pilot said, I've got two kids and a wife. I'm taking one of these parachutes. And he jumped out the airplane door and saved himself. The computer genius said, listen, I am purported by some in, in the world to be the most innovative and important person when it comes to computer technology. If I go down with this plane, it's going to be a terrible loss to humanity. And he took one of the parachutes and he jumped out the airplane door. Then the, uh, the aged minister said to the Boy Scout, now, son, I don't want you to be afraid. I've lived a long life and I'm ready to meet my maker and uh, I'm going to give you that last parachute. And the Boy Scout said, cool it, Reverend. The, small, the smartest man in the world just took my knapsack and jumped out the airplane door. <laughs> the question is, what are you holding on to for your salvation? What are you holding on to for your salvation? It's just the grace of God. He loved you. He satisfied the justice of God on the cross. And it's only Jesus. Jesus plus nothing equals salvation. Jesus plus nothing equals salvation. Say it with me. Jesus plus nothing equals salvation. I want you to bow your heads and close your eyes. And why don't you just lift your hands to the Lord as the Holy Spirit ministers to you right now. You know, the joy of the Lord comes from really understanding grace. And uh, as you're here this morning, I believe the Holy Spirit has brought you here to hear this message. And maybe some of you have, you're just living this kind of like crazy thinking pattern where you're just going to try to do a better person. You're going to try to be a better person. And maybe that's why you came today. And you have come today because the Holy Spirit drew you here. And you should keep coming and growing in your faith. But you need to. Just say, Jesus, I know there's nothing I can do. I'm guilty of breaking your law. I'm guilty of breaking the whole law. And I ask you to forgive me of my sins. And I think what we'll do right now is we'll just pray the prayer that all of us pray to come into the kingdom of God. And let's all pray it. And if you're here and you've never accepted Christ, you've never accepted his amazing grace, just pray that. Pray this prayer I'm about to lead you in with all your heart and let the grace of God fill your heart. Let's pray out loud right now. Just say this with me. Lord Jesus, I know that you are the only way that I can be saved. I put my faith completely in you. I believe that you're the Son of God. I believe that you died on the cross for me. And your death on the cross satisfied the justice and righteousness of God. I accept you and make you Lord. 
Lift up your hands a little higher right now. Say, I accept you, Jesus, as my Lord. Just accept him as your Lord. Let him come into your life right now. Let him fill you with grace. Live this week in celebration of his amazing grace. Thank you, Lord, for the spirit of joy that's coming on our congregation. That in the weeks to come during this series, the spirit of joy is going to be on our church, Lord, as we celebrate the wonderful, amazing grace of God. And we thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen and amen and amen. Thank <laughs> you.